This review is for Galaxy Volume 2, a collection of short stories edited by Frederick Paul, Martin H. Greenberg and Joseph D. Orlander. 30 years of innovative science fiction featuring stories, memoirs and a look behind the scenes by a number of authors, many of them quite famous, some I really like. I don't know that I've ever read Galaxy Volume 1. Okay, short story collections. Are uh, endemic, I would say, to classic science fiction and fantasy because without the magazines, the galaxies, the fantasy and science fiction, weird, it, all of those, without those, I don't know what the world of science fiction would look like today, but it wouldn't look anything like it does. So, short stories are essential to that. But when they're gathered together in a book like this, they are really hard to review. I hate re reviewing and marking these sorts of compositions on Goodreads because you can only give it a single mark and in this volume there's some stories that are absolutely five stars and there's a couple that I would give two stars only because they're classic sci-fi and there's one which I wouldn't even give it one star. I just liked it so much I skim read through it. So yeah, short story, short story collections and classic science fiction. You don't say. So I'll try to keep this under, I'll try to keep the length of this volume down. It's a good collection overall. The first story is called Oh to be a Blowball and it's by Philip K. Dick. It's an excellent story, one that I've read before. It is exactly why I still respect Philip K. Dick considerably despite the fact that I've yet to find a novel of his that I actually like. His he has excellent at short stories. You know, they don't give him enough time to waffle, they don't give him enough time to stream of consciousness. The editors obviously used to smack him down when he started to babble unconsciously. So yes. Anyway, this is a funny, strange, sad sort of idea that I thought was incredibly well done. Beautiful short story, well written. It's tight, it's consistent, no waffle. Phil K apparently considered it a commentary on war, but I felt it was very sharp commentary on so much more than that. It's about the human condition or the global condition, as the case may be, beyond only conflict. It's restored by flagging faith in this author. It's about following a war in an intergalactic war between two species, human and another one. You have a man who was genetically modified to be a spy, so he transformed into what is basically an echoplasmic blob. The blobbles are described as sort of amoeba-like. But it turns out that, well, there's only a couple of dozen of humans in his condition. There are actually blobbles that were also genetically modified to become human. So part of every day, so out, of, out of the 24, maybe 20, they're going to be in one shape, but then they will morph into the other. It's a great commentary. I can see why he thought it was about war. I thought it was very much about greed, humanity, always wanting what you don't or can't have. Great story. The second story was Founding Father by Isaac Asimov and once again an author whose novels I almost routinely despise um, but whose short stories are an absolute marvel. I don't think that Isaac Asimov did good novels. Uh, the Foundation series just wants me to want, to, want to want to cringe in a corner until everything goes away but this was beautiful so there's some interesting points in the intro about how the three about the three greats of sci-fi i actually enjoyed the memoirs for a lot of these really well-known authors as much as i enjoyed the stories there's a little description by the editors about the author in question, then the memoir by the author himself, and then the story, when you have that. Um, in the memoir, Isaac Asimov made a few interesting points, but the Galaxy editors made an excellent point as well. They made the point that people who think of sci-fi think of three greats of sci-fi. And interestingly enough, they gave the three greats as Heinlein, Asimov and Bradbury, which I thought was exceptionally interesting because these days when you see those comp um, those types of three great conversations, they tend to be Heinlein, Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. So that was interesting and it made me go out and read a um, 
Bradbury, so hooray for that. Um, being Asimov, the memoir is rather longer and more impressive than the story itself, though the story is very, very good. It's about a place where dozens of planets have been converted into new Earths. So it's a world building sort of thing. And apparently it was written around an image that was given him of a person, a man standing in a spacesuit with three graves, crosses for graves and space helmets on top of them. And he wrote the story for the image. It's a really, really good story about a small spacecraft that is marooned in this galaxy building world on a world through a series of bad luck coincidences that's very ammonia based and they can't escape and they can't they they the story of what they do do is the story which you should read it was a good story founding father by isaac asimov okay and next is going down smooth by robert silverberg which was a very nice little examination about whether contact with insane humans is going to be enough to drive a computer to insanity. We'd call that an AI today, but you've got this computer, Silverberg has it, that's responsible for analyzing and providing psychotherapy for a whole heap of humans. It goes off on a bit of a weird tangent and starts messing with them significantly. Um, once again, the author thought it was about something different to what I thought it was about. Silverberg thought it was about a story about swearing. And when the computer or the AI swears, it's in ones and zeros. And he's making a comment about the publishing industry and how he couldn't publish stories that had any swear words in them because people complained and there was editing problems. I, of course, am Australian and 2023 swearing is a thing that is so common that you wouldn't even question it. And Silverberg's examination of swearing may not be relevant, but his examination of insane humans possibly able to contaminate a computer? Well worth reading. Did enjoy it. Do like Silverberg in, generally. in general. Good story. Then we have a Larry Niven, All Their Myriad Ways. All Their Myriad Way? Is that really it? Or did I just... Ah, ah, ah. All the Myriad Ways. There we go. By Larry Niven. And there's a little memoir. So far, all of these have been 60s. Uh, pretty soon we've progressed to the 70s, 1970s. Uh, Larry Nivens had a great little story, multiple timelines, psychosis arising from multiple timelines, including suicide and corporation owning the rights to timeline exploration. I feel like this pithy and absorbing little story that was tightly written and really interesting might have been the inspiration for Blake Crouch's recursion that I recently read. If so, Niven did it better. If not, it just shows that all the great stories have already been told because the, the while there's no actual similarity in the story or the characters or the individual events, the overall theme, please don't chew my hair, the overall theme is very much on a similar scale. Right. The Last Flight of Dr. Ain by James Tripty Tree Jr. Now, the intro was really interesting. I've read a bit of James Tiptree Jr. and I've enjoyed it. I find it quite rarely and I never knew much about the author. So apparently the author was incredibly secretive about who she was. And as such, many people in the sci-fi community were chasing down that information for a long time. They now have it. But I would assume that the author is still quite private. There's no memoir. I don't know exactly why. And I don't care. This is a marvellous story. Really well written. Very topical, actually, um, about pandemics. So that works well for these days, where our own pandemic is wending its way into still annoying us. Now, these pandemics are spread through the agency of airlines. Wow, still topical there. And um, viruses that utilize the body's own immunosystems as well as, be, as being about biological warfare. There's a certain amount of tension between countries over this biological warfare. It's like if I believed in crystal balls, I might almost think that 
James Tiptree Jr. Sp person behind had actually seen Into the Future, our future. So this was written in 1969 and so it's prescient in so many ways except the ending. But you know, give us time, we might progress to that ending. I hope we don't, but yeah. Um, so rich, so much to it, so interesting. I'm pretty sure that HIV wasn't around in any known sense in 1969, but that sort of presages that as well as... Yeah, anyway, brilliant book. There's all sorts of little quirks to the writing that make it richer, such as the mention of the Oread, which is a Greek mythology nymph. I like the hanging question of a nature spirit involved in the ending of the human race. This is very much an ending of the human race type story. Great story. Okay, so then there's oh, Algae Budries. A L G I S B U D R Y S. I've never been quite sure how to say his name. Normally, I really love him as an author. I didn't love this. It's titled From Galaxy Bookshelf by Bud Rees. And I was more than a bit mystified by it. It's definitely Americana. It's strong Americana. I think this seems to be him patting himself on the back for having been right about so many things that would happen in the future, which is fine if he's doing that, but I've got no idea what things he's talking about. It's like James Earl Ray, WTF, Friendship Airport, what? Pickle Packers? Is that a food? Turboprop? Are turboprop real things? Wire photos? Surely not. They don't sound real. They sound like science fiction. But from context, I've got no idea if he's talking about reality, psychotic reality, past, future. I've just got no idea. Um, on page 66, I had a second of welcome relief when he mentions Baskin and Robbins. At least I know what Baskins and Robbins are. Um... The comment about wanting a post-apocalyptic world for our unchanged self? I mean... In the end, it does kind of rock and roll if you can make your way through it, but I'm really not sure what that was all about. Anyway. Next was Slow Sculpture by Theodore Sturgeon. It's as beautifully written as everything by Sturgeon ever is. And it's a bit unfair because anyone else writing this story would get accolades and people raving about it forever. But here we just go, oh, Sturgeon, you know, and off you go. Anywho, I've read this story a number of times, several other ones in the books as well. But this one has always stayed with me in several ways. The bonsai. The bonsai mainly was the bit that I remembered. Before I read this when I was in my early teens for the first time, I didn't know much about Japan back then. I certainly didn't know much about bonsai. So in this story, we start in a pear orchard where a man is measuring something in an esoteric method that we don't recognize. Uh, a young woman comes up to him. She's slightly hysterical. We find out that she's found a lump on her breast and that her family history includes breast cancer so her mother and aunt died of it so she's found this lump and now she's hysterics and she's all hysterics and all about to die we're talking about 1970 so medicine back then well yes they did know about lumps in the breast it was pretty crude anyway after they've chatted for a bit they never they never find out their names until right at the end of the story which is awesome I've chatted for a bit and he goes, oh, well, come back to the house and I'll solve it for you. And the reader is left wondering, surely this isn't something that's actually easy in their time frame, in their world? Because otherwise you wouldn't be hysterical about it. So presumably he can do something that no one else can or knows something that no one else knows. They were in a pear, pear orchard. Did I mention that? It's only slightly relevant. So they head back to his house and in the entranceway or the courtyard, I think it's glassed over to protect this immense bonsai. It's huge. And the girl knows the right way to ask about bonsai, which is... <sighs> how long have you had it? It's a question of how long have you had it versus how old is it? Because one's polite and one isn't. Um, anyway, he goes ahead to mix up 
a poison for the cancer that won't actually decimate the rest of her. And while the descriptions for curing what was then basically incurable are random and off the cuff and a bit weird, they are very interesting. And actually, I think Sturgeon here gives one of the neatest descriptions of disease ever and one of the most ambitious ways of addressing the disease in order to cure it. So I heartily wish that this person in this pear orchard existed. There's also a little rant where she says, I think she asks about why this isn't known, why he hasn't shared it. And he goes on a little mini rant about how he's invented so many things and he's created so many things, but people don't want the things. What people want to do is they want to keep on making money and so they will buy the patent off him and then suppress it. A thing that is a rant and is very valid. Uh, I know a couple of people who've come up with some beautiful solutions for energy, renewable energy. Two of them were Australian. Uh, no one in Australia was interested. They ended up selling the patent overseas. And the company that bought it actually just suppressed it because they didn't want to change the oil the oil dynamics of power. So Sturgeon's little ranty rant on that was interesting. At the end of her treatment, the girl goes away, free cured of cancer, we assume, and then he discovers her sitting looking at the um, bonsai, and we believe we have a, a happy, fuzzy, open ended ending where they're in sympathy with each other and they're obviously not going to walk away from each other immediately. But there's a lot there about faith and intelligence and independence and a whole heap of stuff. It's as good a story as ever Sturgeon wrote, I think. And again, it stayed with me over the years and decades. But it was great reading it again because I didn't remember it all that well. Next. <sighs> about a secret crocodile by... R. A. Lafferty. Now, there's also a memoir. The memoir wasn't bad. I feel like I know R. A. Lafferty. I'm sure I've read other things by this author. I don't remember them. I don't remember hating them. But about a secret crocodile was that was it was either a one star or two star rating in this little collection. So it starts with the fact that I'm not really all that crazy about comic sci-fi. There's exceptions. Alan Dean Foster wrote a really funny book about a punk, a overachieving academic, and a girly girl being hijacked. It's called Glory Road. It's on the shelf behind me. I've never let it go once I got my hands on it. That was exceptional. There's The Hitchhiker's Guide, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, all of those, Restaurant at the End of the Universe. They are intensely humour and nothing but, and they're sci-fi, and they're thoroughly good. But with those and a few other notable exceptions, I approach comic sci-fi with caution. If you're trying for humour, there's lots of kinds of humour. My favourite's dark humour. But the full-on zany comic attitude, not my thing. So caution. About a secret crocodile is trying too hard to be funny in my personal, entirely subjective viewpoint. It is trying so hard that the story that it has written is virtually meaningless. There is so much quirk, one drowns in it. It's like drowning in soft, sticky caca. Quirk, quirk, quirk. So much of it. It's like trying to breathe outside when the humidity is 90% and it's 40 degrees centigrade. It's like, it's just boring it's so quirky it's boring and i suspect that the only reason that this swamp of kaka ever made it to any magazine let alone this collection is that the author's name got it through because it's not fun to read i don't even know i don't know what it was trying to do except quirk at you Every sentence you have to stop and analyze for what it's, uh, if it's a real thing, if it's a fake thing, if it's a relevant thing, and very, very swiftly one stops caring. There's three central characters, each of whom has a natural talent, and those characters and their natural talents could actually be interesting if 
they do themselves were not drowning in and quirky Ugh. loathe that one hope i remember that and never read it again okay then we have cold friend and a memoir by Helen Allison. Helen Allison is Helen Allison, so the memoir is pity, Allison ocentric, and quite fun. He's a great writer. He's got he's got dubious views, though. Let's face it. Helen Allison, I'm pretty sure, was a polarizing character in the sci-fi world, and a lot of his stories can be quite polarizing to those of us who read them. Larger than life, to be sure, but still. Um, I would read the memoir for sure. That's it tells how this story came to be written in three hours, and that's that's an absolute humble brag because it's a good little story. At its core, it shares details with the day of the Triffids or twelve monkeys, etc. Man wakes up in hospital, having he was pretty sure died, rips out the, the tubes and, and the sheet off him, and finds out he is the only person and alive in the hospital. He's the only person in the hospital. There's just nothing else there. Not dead people, not real people, nothing. And that his entire world is basically this little floating bit of space. Two blocks around the hospital is all he's got. And then it adds, ends in one of those floating, floating cities in the sky type images um, that you get from Magritte or other painters like that. And he's wandering around doing his own thing and all of a sudden he starts being invaded by things like Vikings or raging baboons or stuff and he gets through that, it stops, and one other person appears and that is the story which I am not going to spoil up for you because it's actually quite a good story. Up to the end. The end is not good. That's where you really are reminded that Alison, Alison had was he misogynistic or was he just misan misandrous? Did he really just dislike all of humanity exceptionally? Or was it just his stories? I don't know. There's a lot of value judgment about how all a woman really matters is whether she's pretty or ugly at the end of this one. Bit cringe, bit cringe, but quite Alison. And while it wasn't my favourite story ever because of the cringy bit at the end, it was still a pretty good story. Next we go on to The Day Before the Revolution by Ursula Le Guin. Le Guin is Le Guin and her writing is gorgeous. It's a not that short story. It's single person perspective of an old woman in a post-revolution society. Now this was written in 1974 and apparently it was written as a prequel to The Dispossessed. I feel like I probably have read The Dispossessed. But I feel like it was a really, really long time ago. I don't remember it very well. So this is basically a standalone short story for me. And it's a great commentary about what happens after a revolution, who the leaders might, may find themselves being once the revolution's over and their envisaged society is there. They're not the person who brought about that revolution, but they're inescapably part of it. I would say it's much more of a social commentary than it is science fiction. It might possibly be set on another world. I'm not sure. It doesn't really much matter. Social commentary. It may well have been social commentary about real world events, though I can't pinpoint what they would have been. And I love the fact that Le Guin creates such a rich, fascinating character of an old woman. We've got descriptions of things like being dizzy when one stands up, the physical changes that occur on your body making you feel dynamically different rather than you and your body being a single image, a single oneness as you are when you're young. As you grow old you start dissociating yourself from the parts of your body that aren't the way you want them to be anymore. Brilliant piece of writing, not so much for its science fiction element but for its pure humanistic element I guess. Okay. God, reviewing these things takes it out of you. Maybe I should just review every story as its own review. No. Anyway, the next is The Gift of the Gary Golly by Frederick Paul and C.M. Cornbluth. Apparently, they were co-editors and they wrote together. Um, the introduction to it is interesting. 
as I recall. Yes, the introduction to it is really quite interesting because of the co-writing element. The story is quite long. It's one of the longer ones in the collection. And while it does have a couple of concepts that are interesting, it is overall one super 100% cringe in its misogyny. Unintentionally misogynistic, but acutely so. So the fact that it was written by two different authors comes across, I suspect, in the fact that it's two different stories. One is notes from an operative called Gary Goley to his home base. Um, they're an away team tasked with surveying a new planet for geology, ecology, all that sort of things. And through these short notes, we come to the realization that there's um, directives, not Star Trek directives either, there's directives about how you treat indig ind indigenous life forms, especially intelligent ones, and they're having difficulty with them. I'm going to spoiler this quite significantly. At first you don't know much about the Gary Goalie, but over time you, you, you realise that the problem that they're having with their intelligent life forms is size related. They are so much smaller than the intelligent life forms that there's no way to create any form of contact with them. Um, and that's what's causing their directive problems. The other part of the story is about some ordinary American dude with an ordinary American wife, house and small child and an ordinary American job in a plastics factory or something. Um, Dupois. Dupois is his name. And it starts off with them having been handed a huge debt because his wife co-signed a document to, for her brother to check into rehab and now they've lumped with the whole debt. It's There's an element of quirkiness. It's, it's hard to imagine that even in the 70s there weren't certain measures that could be taken that wouldn't involve the loss of your house, but that seems to be where, where it's standing as we go into this story. <sighs> the story itself, as it develops, and we realise that the Gary Goli are actually on, hum on Earth and they're trying to repay a human with knowledge. The only thing they can think of is manufacturing gold for him, but he's too dumb to see that the gold keep that keeps manifesting around him. He is a dimwit. The problem with this slow evolution is that it's too slow. I felt the story was way, way too long. But the misogyny, it was acute. The notion that all a woman needs to be able to do is run a house, a baby and a husband to be a 100% contributing member of society. It's like, pass the bucket on that one, guys. That was bad enough. But later on... Dupois, is, she signed this document without reading it, so now they're too, they can't repay it, they're going to lose their house. They can't commit her for being a dimwit because she can run a house, a baby and a husband. Seriously, pass that bucket. Um, and when Dupois discusses the problem with someone else, the someone else gives us his opinion that if his wife signed a document like that, he would break her arm and keep breaking it until she stopped doing things like that. <sighs> I don't know for sure that Frederick Paul and this Cornbluth guy I don't know were actually misogynistic. I'm, I would hate to imagine that they actually think that breaking their wives' limbs is an okay response to having something done they don't approve of. But they are enough a product of their time that they think that writing that about breaking a wife's arm for doing something is funny. So this one is poorly dated. Um, it's not terribly well written either, to be honest. I didn't love it. I didn't love it enough to be able to ignore how acutely unpleasant it is. This is a story that I would only recommend to serious sci-fi buffs of those two authors um, are possibly to incels. I'm sure that incels would love it. 
if you know any incels who want to get into science fiction, maybe give them this one in the hopes that it'll lead them to into better written, more sociologically apt stories and that they may become human beings one day. On to the second last, Overdrawn at the Memory Bank by John Varley. I don't know Varley very well. Um, apparently he was a very noteworthy author at one stage and he writes really, really well. This story, is like another one of the longer ones, is fascinating and intriguing. It's about a future human race. Uh, I think we had to leave the Earth. We're on the moon. Everything's quite sterile and sterile and controlled. People have very fabulously long lifestyles, but the main character in this is stressed. Fingal is his name. His psychologist has suggested that he go on holiday, which means retrieving his memory, implanting it in a cube that will be implanted in a lioness that will roam the Kenyan belts that have been recreated underneath the moon. Um, this is their idea of a stress-free holiday. And he does that. It starts off when he's having his memories um, reduced and put into the cube that will be inserted into the lion. And the way in which the backstory is given to us by Vali is extremely good. You've got, we're told that children are pretty rare in this future society, but there's a teacher who's showing around five, nine-year-olds while this is being done. And the teacher's explaining this to the nine-year-olds is how you find out about the science element of what's happening. Really well done. I like that. And it carries over. One of the nine-year-olds does a thing that means that Varley's body, Finley's body, sorry, <laughs> not Varley's body, Finley's body, instead of being stored safely while he's on his vacation in the Kenyan lioness, has been lost. So he spends years and years in a computer simulation while they try to find their body. It's got a funny ending. It's got interesting introspection on how Fingal deals with the computer simulation because he wakes up from what should be his holiday um, and instead of being on holiday, he wakes up in his room, he finds out that he's actually in a computer simulation and he has to go through day by day living in order to keep himself sane while his body is located and he's reinserted into it. It's a great story. This is pure classic sci-fi. It's all the best of pure classic sci-fi that we know and love exceptionally well. Storyboarded and written by Varley, who I now want to read more of. Okay, um, Alfred Bester comes next with Hor Horace Galaxica. So, this is the winding up of the book. I don't think I've missed any of the individual stories. I think I've at least mentioned all of them. And Alfred Bester is basically talking about his relationship with Galaxy and with Horace Gold and it's kind of a wind up to the whole era of science fiction which Galaxy was operating in when it was buying stories from all these noteworthy authors. Quite like the cover. I've only just now figured out what that picture was. It looked very South American-ish weird but I've now realized that that's actually a uh, reference to something that's happening in Overdrawn at the Memory Bank. A very edited reference but yeah. So that that little glowy cube is probably meant to represent the cube into which Finley's consciousness was, was put. That lion in a suit is presumably meant to represent Varley. The gorgeous woman with the long black hair and the wings was thoroughly naked in the book but you're not going to get away with that in a compilation of science fiction stories that was published in 1980. Now, are you? I managed to do this without taking too long. Good little compilation. I hope I remember it. A couple of these stories I will definitely want to reread. A couple of them I really, really hope I remember to never go near again. Let me know what you thought of them if you read it. If you've read number one, tell me about that. I actually wouldn't mind getting my hands on number one. And as ever, does all the things the algorithm likes, commenting, liking, subscribing and stuff. And have a great new year and may 2024 be full of wonderful books that are read.
because reading books is awesomeness. <laughs>